Thank you all for coming to the Wheeler Center for tonight's discussion on the future of sex. Before I introduce the panel, I'll briefly introduce myself. My name is Cindy Darnell. I'm a sex therapist and a sex educator, among other things, also a bit of a girl around town from time to time. <laughs> if you'd like to know more about that, you can ask me during the Q&A, which will be happening at around about 10 past seven tonight. So, in the meantime, let me introduce you to the panel. The first panelist immediately to my left is Anne Hunter. Anne has been polyamorous for over two decades, during which time she co-founded Polyvic, one of Melbourne's poly communities, and has facilitated numerous poly education seminars, workshops, and discussion groups for the last decade, and she's been a passionate relationships coach in this time as well. She is one half of Your Relationship Tool Belt, the first non-monogamy education business in Australia, of which she is aware, and she has numerous partners, lovers, and intimates, and she cohabits with over a hundred wombats of the stuffed <laughs> variety. Please welcome Anne Hunter. <laughs> the panelist immediately to Anne's left is Linda Kirkman. Linda has been taking an unconventional approach to relationships and family formation since 1988 when she gave birth to her niece. Yes, I said her niece. In Australia, in Australia's first IVF surrogacy. She has been a sex educator since 1990 and from the start has focused on communication skills and pleasure as integral to sex education. Her nearly finished PhD study of baby, boober, sorry, baby boomers in friends with benefits relationships has led to exploring academic research on polyamory and consensual non-monogamy. She loves the media and with, oh sorry, she loves social media, excuse me. <laughs> I think I'm going to get spanky. <laughs> she <wish>. loves... <laughs> <laughs> That's for a different panel. <laughs> she loves social media and without the hyperbole, says Twitter has transformed her life with the new tribes she has found. Please welcome Linda Kirkman. <laughs> and last but not least. James Dominguez is a video games journalist by trade, but when he isn't shooting things, he's an advocate for bisexuals, pansexuals, and others without labels. A decade ago, he co-founded the Melbourne Bisexual Discussion Group, which he still facilitates every month. In 2010, he co-founded Bisexual Alliance Victoria, Inc., a community building advocacy and activism group for everyone outside the gay straight binary. He even combined his passions recently by speaking on several panels about diversity at the Penny Arcade Expo. He lives in the northern suburbs of Melbourne with his wife, his boyfriend, his wife's boyfriend, and a couple of cats. Please welcome James Dominguez. So tonight's discussion on the future of sex, we aim to sort of be covering a lot of ground, quite a bit of turf, but one of the main things that really comes up in, in the way that society has changed and the way that relationships have changed or are in the process of changing potentially is the way that we are not only viewing them but also the way that we are living them. So one of the things that we see everywhere is that there are so many examples of, of sort of dualism and binary in our society, that we have concepts of good and bad and black and white and gay and straight and male and female, and these ideas of God and the devil that everywhere we go, we are met with twos of things. Even on Noah's Ark, there was two of everything and only two and no more. So when we understand from a cultural perspective that this uh, is really embedded in the, in the psyche of the Western mindset. It really alters our ability, I guess, to, to understand and discuss relationships when our thought processes are, are so narrowed into that way and our language is narrowed into such a, such a way of speaking. How do you, panellists, 
feel that that notion of binary affects our ability to express sexuality in ways outside of this? It's mm. a great question. Who wants to start? <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind, but yeah, feel free. I, oh. I actually see Western society as being addicted to certainty. Oh, um, very good. Bang, straight off the mark. <laughs> there is... What we see in our media all the time is the, this aversion to subtlety and nuance and complexity. Yes. People, a lot of people, not everybody, but, but a, a significant number of people like things to be very easily and clearly defined, um, very clearly delineated into pigeonholes. And they are not just <laughs> uncomfortable or afraid of things that don't fit into these boxes, but it makes, it makes people angry. They're, they're angered by it. And, uh, and I, th I see this as a, a, a very big problem that confronts us on a number of issues, not, not, just, not just sexuality, mm. but uh, sexuality is definitely mm. impacted by it. that's a really good point. And I think one of the things that then happens is that people feel obliged to fit one of the boxes and then shut down um, or try to repress or pretend it doesn't exist, you know, the, the, the bits of themselves that don't fit mm. those boxes. Yeah. That's one of the impacts that I see quite regularly in relationship coaching. Yes. Um, and uh, another thing that I think is a really major impact is we don't have language for things outside of mm. the two boxes. Mm. And that often limits people from even being able to imagine things outside mm. the boxes. And I mean, one of the examples I often use with this is um, that I have people that I call intimates because there isn't really a label for the kind of relationship that uh -huh. we have. Well, that was going to, I was uh, interested in knowing with, for all of you in the way that you obviously are very much involved in this community to, to varying degrees, what has been your experience of this? I just want to pick up on um, the point Anne made about language. I gave a, a conference presentation three years ago about naming, or about de de defining friends with benefits. And somebody came up to me out of that and said, that's just what I need in my life. I didn't know what it was and now there's a word mm -hmm. and a description and mm -hmm. instantly be having the language meant she could envision a relationship that was not the standard kind of mm -hmm. you know, monogamous or just couple in a house together, but mm -hmm. something that she could run, organise her life mm -hmm. in a different way. Mm -hmm. So language is really powerful. Yeah, it mm -hmm. really is. Mm -hmm. It really is. And I, I mean, I think we've, well, I know that I've experienced, and I think you've experienced, James, people not believing that my lifestyle is possible, um, that it can work, uh -huh. that it's possible to do it ethically, that it exists, you know. <laughs> um, that's another thing that I see um, as an outcome of it, and it's, it's been, um, so one of the impacts that that has on me um, is that I have a job as a polyamory educator um, because I've had to defend and explain and explain and explain and explain yeah. to a lot of people yeah. um, that these things are even possible yeah. and what they can look like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the things that is a, is a recurring theme at the discussion groups every month is that so often people will come along and just say, it's so nice to know that you know, I, I'm, I exist, like I'm, I'm actually, I'm not some weird isolated freak, I actually belong to a group that exists, that pre-exists me and it's larger than me and I'm not, you know, just some isolated, you know, fringe instance, I, I actually have a community and I, yeah. have, I have other people who are like me and I have mm. people who understand me. Yeah. Mm. And I see, even from a therapeutic point of view, that when people feel that whatever definitions are socially provided to them, that when, as you were saying, when they don't fit in, that they then sort of tend to internalise that sense of distance or that sense of displacement, and it ends up, you know, in manifesting as sort of feeling bad about yourself, feel, feeling depressed, all kinds of things, feeling isolated, feeling lonely, when sometimes just the capacity to think outside the square automatically doesn't necessarily change everything but gives you the opportunity to just get a fresh breeze to come through where things can just feel a little bit better um linda in academia what has 
been what have people's responses been to your 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 study that must have ruffled a few well, feathers well the reaction that i got from the audience i mean i normally get that that is so cool as mm. a response to what i'm doing and in the early days when i said friends with benefits relationships i got one or two responses it was either uh what's that which was usually from people who were in long term monogamous relationships and weren't weren't looking for anything different and um and then, uh, oh, I know half a dozen people you could interview would be the other reaction from people <laughs> ah. who, who, were, who were engaging in maybe they'd had a long-term relationship that had split up and they were moving mm. out. So from, from an academic perspective, most people are just jealous of my PhD topic. Mm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. And then it's interesting that, you know, when you sort of put it out there as a, as a thesis topic and then, then the sort of the whispers start happening, oh, I know somebody who's da-da-da-da, and all of a sudden these people start coming out of the woodwork with, well, you know, now that you mention it, I do know somebody mm. who lives like that only when there's permission to, yes. s- to say it. And, and it's that being that beacon of permission, which probably all of us mm. are, mm. people mm. people tell me mm. stories mm. all the time. I hear the most interesting details about people's yeah. lives. Well, one, of, one of the things that fascinates me about that as well is that <clears throat> I've noticed that there's, a, there's this thing that goes on where a lot of the things that we talk about openly, you know, people will sort of frown about that, but it's not so much what we're talking about or what we're advocating, it's that we're open about it. We dare to be open and honest about it. Because there are, like for centuries, probably as long as the human race has been around, there's been the whole, oh, you know, he has his mistress, but we don't talk about that. (laughs) Exactly. You know, and it's like, and it's accepted as something that happens. But when you actually say, hey, why don't you with the mistress go out for coffee? That's when people go, whoa, no. (laughs) I know, and it astonishes me how many people I come across <clears throat> Excuse me. Who are morally more comfortable with cheating than they are with open polyamory? Yes, that I have blows my mind. Yeah, in, in, with that, there, I guess that there is certainly, again, in, in a broader sense of the community, and again, as James was saying about this addiction to certainty that, that Westerners seem to have, um, that when we start discussing open relationships or even alternative relationships, what seems to come up is this notion of irresponsibility, Mm. that to be in some version of a non-monogamous relationship implies irresponsibility and that that the desire to sort of uh, want to have your cake and eat it too Mm. is... Oh, we love that phrase, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So what... Uh. Where how accurate? How I mean, how accurate is this? Is this idea that it's decadent and hedonistic mm-hmm. and, and irresponsible? So I think that starts with the sex negativity mm-hmm. that we have in our world, and I, I mean, I think, and I think I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but research shows that pleasure is good for you. Mm-hmm. Um, sex is good for you. Sex is good for you. Good things, pleasurable things, are good for you. So um, yeah, I think that. You know, we have a very sex-negative world, and I think we could go on for ages about where that comes from. Mm. But I think that's what's underpinning um, a lot of people's attitude about it being irresponsible. One of the things that I hear about polyamory quite a lot is, "Oh, well, that's all right while you're young and single, mm-hmm. but you know, it can't. You must not do it when you have kids. It will definitely damage your kids. Ah. That kind of thing. So, you know, responsible people will naturally want to revert." To monogamy. Yeah, because so it's that thing of you know it's okay for the adults, but what about the kids? Yeah, but, kind of yeah, argument. Yeah. And it's another it's a, it's another um, strand of the same mm-hmm. attitude. And of course, research actually shows, and I don't know if you know about this, but the re- the research in in families um, in non monogamous families in polyamory and, and stuff like that is that in fact um, the the kids do just as well, like a, about the same um, on most parameters of well being. And actually, often score slightly higher on things like negotiation skills and communication. <laughs> uh-huh. oh, what a surprise! Yeah. Um, but we, what the research is robust on is that the more loving adults a kid has in their life, the better they'll do. Mm-hmm. Um, and poly families often are really good at creating tribes of loving, multiple loving adults. Mm. 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 Um, so. What would you then say to folk who are sort of deeply challenged by the notion of a non-monogamous relationship, children aside, I mean, would you say anything or would you just walk away? I respect <laughs> people's right to, to mm. have the kind of relationship they want. I'm not mm. trying to suggest that it's, it's for everybody. Mm. One thing I did 
uh, recently inspired by a, a journal article describing how, how poly family, a, a poly relationship had all kinds of really useful things that could enhance a conventional marriage, mm. not necessarily by having extra sexual relationships, but by having a wider community mm. with mm. whom you shared things like loving mm. adults for kids or mm. meals together or, or support people and, and just a, a, a network of mm. a, a more tight community. Mm. So I, I organised a, a regular series of dinners in my, just with my neighbours, inspired by that, where mm -hmm. we took it in turns to cook and... Mm. and built that, that, mm. that community. Yeah. Mm. But uh, in similar terms to what we've been talking about, about breaking down binaries, I mean, it's not like there's a, there's a sharp black and white binary between monogamous and non-monogamous people <laughs> either. Uh -huh. I mean, there are, there's, there's a wide range. I mean, there are, there are people for whom, you know, like the, uh, making a, monog a non-monogamous relationship work is really important to them. They find it very difficult, but they, they really work at it. And then there are those for whom it's very easy. Mm. And there's a wide, wide spectrum in between. Mm. So what are some of the models, I guess, of non-monogamy? Because um, I guess, you know, for folks who are perhaps not in the room here, but maybe watching uh, on the recording, thinking, oh, is that that whole sort of keys in the bowl mm. kind of situation? <laughs> Which, yeah. not that there's anything wrong with that, but it, it, if you don't know what yeah. the options are... Um, that it's not necessarily just a free for all. So, so um, polyamory is commonly misunderstood as being sleeping around, self-centered, um, uh, pleasure at the expense, like being willing to cross other people's boundaries and not, you know, getting back to the irresponsible yeah. thing. It's, you know, all understood to be that. So it's misunderstood as just cheating or just sleeping around. Mm. Um, or it's the same as swinging, where and, and look, there's a big, big crossover between polyamory mm. and swinging. Um, but traditionally, swinging, uh, the emphasis of swinging is on recreational sex, mm -hmm. um, and the emphasis of something like polyamory is on the emotional intimacy mm -hmm. and the emotional relationship. Mm -hmm. So quite a lot of um, poly relationships won't necessarily be sexual. Um, some some people. That's a very very interesting point. Mm. So yeah. it's actually putting the emphasis on the on the, the emotional as well yeah, as the amour. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That's right. Mm. And so there, like you can be asexual and polyamorous. Mm -hmm. um, and there are. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Wait for the Q and A. <laughs> <laughs> because okay, so let me give you an example of of somebody I call an intimate. Okay, I've got a few people in this category of people that I. Um, maybe don't have sex with, but I will take off all my clothes and jump into bed mm -hmm. naked mm -hmm. and cuddle and talk about absolutely anything mm. to, to as deep as we go. Mm -hmm. Now, that is way past what most monogamous people would consider to be a friendship. Absolutely. Mm. But if we're not having sex, we're not lovers, we're not making life decisions together, we're not partners, what do you call them? And that's... Um, I, I remember having, like, I was actually talking to a church group once about polyamory, and one of the women... As you do. Yes, I actually got invited to talk to a church. It's uh, probably the only time it's happened in Australia. Uh, but one of the women, as we were talking about the different kinds of levels of connection you can have. So, you know, you can have friendship, which can be activity-based, and you can have emotional connection. You can have romance. You can have sex, and they're not the same thing. Like, mm -hmm. you can have one without the other. Um, you can co-parent, you can cohabit, you can be financially blended. There are so many different forms mm -hmm. of connection that you can have. Mm -hmm. And in monogamy, there's this kind of expectation that you'll get the whole lot in one, mm -hmm. one package. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were talking about you know, these different forms of connection. And she suddenly realised that she had a beyond friendship kind of connection with the guy down the road where he would mow her lawn and she did something around his... You know, I don't know, something <laughs> about his house. Knowing her lawn's not a euphemism, is it? No, it was not a euphemism. <laughs> no, it was completely not sexual, but it was... It, she realised that it had a sense of intimacy, and again, because she'd never had the language outside relationship or friend, mm. you know? That was one or the other, and mm. it wasn't a relationship because they weren't having sex and they weren't living together and doing the mm. enmeshed thing. Mm. But mm. she realised that it had a sense of intimacy and was an important relationship to her mm -hmm. um, that she hadn't had the words to value mm -hmm. appropriately yeah. until we talked it through. Mm -hmm. yeah. and I think, again, it does come back to... I mean, this, the sex negativity, which I think actually comes 
from at a more base level pleasure negativity mm. um, this this idea that um, you know to to work and to suffer is virtuous mm. to relax and to enjoy yourself is you know mm. not virtuous mm. and um, so there's that idea that it, because one of the things that makes polyamory work so well for those who for those who really make it work is that it um, it allows you to find exactly what you need to fulfill you. Um, mm. So like one of the classic examples of, is somebody who's in a, a really good, happy, healthy, long-term, mon uh, relatively monogamous relationship, except one of the partners is kinky and mm. the other one is not. And they can say, well, um, you know, if this is something that's important to you and it's something you need to explore, then by all means, Find a find a kinky partner. And this might be somebody with whom you won't even have a meal with or share anything else with. It's just there's that you find mm -hmm. that that one connection, and it's like it's like so I've got you know all these various these various sort of appetites that uh, that need to be fed to make me you know strong and healthy emotionally. Um, and if I if I've got this partner who feeds like eighty percent of them, the traditional monogamous model is well that twenty percent you just deal with it. Mm, you know, stay hungry. Yeah. Yes, you yes. stay hungry mm, exactly. Yes. Yeah. And but polyamory says, well, you actually have the freedom to go and find that twenty percent mm. elsewhere. You know, mm. within the within the boundaries of you know mm. um, consent mm. and negotiation and and, and boundary mm. setting. So and is so that polyamory or consensual non-monogamy? Because there's a bit of a blurred line <laughs> yes. with the definition. I jump all over with those with those terminology with the term. And that's a. I mean, that's another good question: is what? How do you define all of these mm. different mm. things? And I personally, um, so like I said. People who identify as polyamory, it comes from poly meaning many and amor meaning love. So multiple loves. Um, and, uh, but there's such a big crossover with open relationship, non-monogamy, ethical non-monogamy, consensual non-monogamy. Um, Infidelity, which is a whole different thing again with an attitude that's very different. Yeah, well the main thing that most people would s that's one thing that poly people agree on. It's really hard to get poly people to agree on anything. <laughs> <laughs> including the definition of polyamory. Yeah. Uh, but the things that they agree on are that it's multiple, that it's loving, and that it's honest. And by that I mean that all people involved are genuinely, they all know, and they're genuinely happy about it. This is mm. not, you know, don't ask, don't tell, where somebody's really not happy. Mm. Mm -hmm. And when I first started reading about all of the different versions of, of I guess, maybe non-monogamy perhaps more than polyamory, um, was that my initial assumptions were that, oh, well, if one is, then the other one must be, for example, mm. in, a, in, a, in a partnership, that, you know, that both have to be doing the same things. Um, and then upon finding out that you can be sort of like poly-mono or mono-poly, that Absolutely. one can be poly and the other one doesn't necessarily need to be, I was like, oh, that's an interesting twist, isn't it? Mm. That <laughs> we my, don't my, all have to follow the same model. My wife's partner is, is monogamous. Mm. Um, he has no interest in other relationships. Yeah. He's, he's quite happy with just the one partner yeah. and he's also happy with his partner having other partners. Mm. So. Mm. so for... Folks who perhaps would be considering even just sort of broaching the discussion mm. with their partner of, you know, one week, one year, a lifetime, uh, opening up the relationship, what, what would be some of the potential struggles that people starting out on a non-monogamous path might encounter in the early stages? I reckon being willing to communicate, being being on the same level about uh, having discussions about feelings and just processing issues. Mm. If one person is wants to be thorough and explore, and the other person is just happy to stay on another on a non on a pretty basic communication mm -hmm. level, mm -hmm. I would see that would be a huge barrier. Because one of the things that I've gathered from all the stuff I've read about um, poly poly relationships is that communication and and, and the processing and the planning and mm. it's it's that really really in, uh, profound deep communication understanding is really vital to it to mm. it, to being successful anyway and self exploration as well. Yeah, I think self awareness is one of the biggest ones. Actually knowing what I want and getting over the shame that why I can often feel around what I want. Mm. That is one of the biggest things. Um, and then learning how to put it into words. Yeah. And then learning how to deal with my partner's reaction to that 
and them working out how they feel and putting that into words and all of that kind of stuff. Mm. So self-awareness and that very basic communication mm. about how we feel and working out what do I need um, to feel valued in this relationship and what is ego issue that's mm. actually something I need to, you know, possessiveness or something that I ne actually need to learn to get over, mm. finding, finding the balance mm. amongst all of those mm. at what rate can I move you what what's common uh, mm. is somebody who's really yep oh, i want to go here and somebody else who's really not sure mm. um and how do we balance our respective needs our differing needs mm. um those are some of the challenges that people have as well as one of the other ones is really unrealistic ideas of how it's going to work mm. ah can you speak more about that I, I think one of the one of the pitfalls that people often fall into with this sort of thing is that they they see like they come along to like Polyvic or some other um, or some other event and they'll see everyone making it work mm -hmm. and it seems like this idyllic fairy tale and you know it's like it's like watching the Olympics and seeing somebody you know sprint the hundred meters in some crazy number of seconds and you just sort of go uh, saying, you you don't see the years that went into training up to yeah. that point. <laughs> You know, and you know, so you'll see you'll see these relationships working, and people will go, "Oh, you know, these people make it work. How hard can it be?" <laughs> yeah, and and they don't know that you know you sort of go, "Oh, you know, oh, you, how do you not get jealous?" And it's like I did, mm. and I probably I probably still will in the future. Mm. I haven't for a while, mm. but it's not like mm. it's not like I'm immune to it, and it'll yeah. never happen again. Yeah. So it sounds like you know from what you guys are saying that it's not so much an issue of. Of uh, I guess of not having issues, it's about actually laying the issues out on oh. the table, mm. and and as you were saying, and that the shame that can come with that mm. in some cases, mm -hmm. I guess, can be paralysing because mm. shame being one of the most powerful emotions that tends to shut us down and and contract us rather than expand us, and so what you're offering as an alternative is to actually talk it out, to give it voice, to breathe life into it, yeah. just to see what happens. There's no certainty, as you were saying. I mean, Brene Brown's work on shame and vulnerability oh, yeah. is, is brilliant around that. And I think she's dead, you know, dead right, certainly my experience mm. has been, that the way to r reduce shame is to uh, share it, to talk about mm. it, to communicate. Mm. Um, and I've certainly found that mm. myself. And the an experience that I had was, uh, quite a few years ago when my wife got into her first serious um, additional relationship, um, the, the jealousy I felt uh, caught me so much by surprise because I, I thought, you know, you know I, had the, I had the theory down, I, I can do this, this is all fine. <laughs> and then I saw just how quickly the, this relationship became so important and I was so jealous and so insecure and that was bad. But the thing that was most crippling to me was the shame that followed on mm. on that with me wanting to do better. Like I so wanted, mm. I so wanted to be happy for her. I wanted to be supportive, and the fact that I felt so jealous and so insecure, yeah, the the shame of those emotions was what really, really, you know, bound me up and mm. really, really made me unhappy. Mm. Yeah, and it's a common thing with, with poly people um, who feel like, you know, if you're a good poly person, you don't get jealous. And it's just ah. not true. Yeah, just yeah. not true. <laughs> That's my intellectual response to that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so, are there certain personality types who are better at polyamory than others? You have to really want to go on your own personal journey of self-exploration. If you're not interested in knowing about yourself and understanding yourself, you're in for a bit of a rough trot, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to enjoy spending time relating. Because mm -hmm. if you think of how much time it takes to build up one relationship, mm -hmm. you know, it takes up... a significant amount of extra time to build up an extra relationship mm. and there's a bunch of other complicated things to work out there mm. so you mm. need to enjoy relating and enjoy um, self-exploration mm. mm. and I think uh, I'm just trying to remember I know I've read a research article about this and I'll try and remember what they found something to do with 
if you're, if you're an insecure person, it's probably not for you. Mm. So mm. Having, having a sense of being grounded and a, a secure confi confidence mm. in yourself um, is a good start as well okay. because that means you're less likely to be uh, worried about the jealousy aspect. So you, know, you're, you, look, you, look, you don't believe you're going, nah. Maybe I've remembered just, I remember this research differently. I, I, I have a history of, of depression and, uh, and low self-esteem and, uh, and I'm... Mm. Oh, I didn't mean my you had my to be relationship with confidence is uh, okay. is, is complicated. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've read right. in other situations that some people, and I, this is just an idea that I'm throwing out, that some people argue or suggest with passion that polyamory is an orientation. It's another way of expressing one's own erotic way of being. What do you think about that? Is there research on that, Linda? That Christian Cleese from, um, in Manchester, the University of Sheffield, mm. has published recently on mm. that. Basically saying, what do people think? So I, I don't know, they don't come up with any def definitive answer. Mm. There is a debate about, is it an orientation yeah. Yeah, or yeah, is yeah. it not? I think yeah. the jury's out. Yeah. Mm. I, I certainly feel like I couldn't be monogamous. I was married for two mm. years and that was just long enough to <laughs> get through all of my marriage enculturation and get it out of my system. Um, and realise, and then after that I could look back and see, I mean I grew up conservative Christian so I had a lot of stuff to get rid of, um, <laughs> but I could look back and I could see all my life uh, my, my inclination had been to multiple relationships and there are distinct points where mm. I had felt I had to choose and I almost flipped a coin. Yeah. Yeah. So. And so then did you find that that part of you was able to take greater flight as you matured as a person, as you grew into your skin, that with maturity it became an easier process? Oh, yes. Without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah. I can't tell you how much joy my lifestyle gives me now. <laughs> <laughs> and You can see it the, in your eyes. <laughs> and, and, you know, I am able to have really tricky conversations um, with partners and lovers and metamors, that's partners, other partners, um, mm -hmm. for those who don't know, and, and, and other people around it. And it, oh, it is so much easier mm. having really learnt to... Like I was, I was telling somebody today that I had a, a partnership of eight years that was, I, was really important to me and it stopped being a partnership and that was deep grief. And we've recently reconnected and I had to learn to completely let go and simply be able to be in the moment with this person and it's gorgeous now. Mm. And that took quite a bit of personal work to be able to get there and I'm so glad I did because mm. it's great. And it's amazing because those, those moments of joy can come very unexpectedly from, yeah. from strange directions that yeah. you never... Yeah, just, just the, simple, the simple fact, like, just, just that simple act of like, you know, walking into the house and finding two people that you love mm. deep in conversation or playing, or playing a card game together or just... Or kissing. Just, <laughs> you know <laughs> that too, um, it, and just sort of going, yeah. These uh, like my love for these two people brought them together, and now they're connecting on their own terms, and it's it's just a wonderful thing when that happens. And getting back to language, I mean, there's a there's a word we've had to invent our own words for things. Mm. So polyamorists have invented the word compersion, which is that joy that you experience that you were just talking about of seeing people you love being loved by other people. Mm. Um, and it's a great feeling, and a lot of people don't think it's possible. Yeah, and I guess, I mean, certainly with, with the maturing process, one just in general becomes calmer, ideally, hopefully, um, which sort of leads me, I guess, to my next idea, and Linda, this is directed more so at you, with your, your research around boomers in particular. So, because what I see in my work is in my, a lot of the client therapy that I do, younger people coming to have uh, counselling around open relationships. There seems to be a real sort of trend in younger people doing it, uh, which is fine. But what we're also seeing is that as, one, as we mature, just as people, um, our capacity to manage emotions often, not always, but sometimes is better. Yet there is this idea that the older generations are more conservative. So what's mm. been your take on older folks taking up well, in, this in, as a in lifestyle? Well, in preparation for tonight, I had a, a read of the most recent Sex in Australia study mm. that's just been launched, looking for the... And 
I was unhappy with how the questions were phrased because one question said, it referred to people having an affair, which is not what polyamory is. Mm. But, um, but even, even using that language, young people were very much against, were more, more against it. It was the older, the people in their 50s and 60s who were more open-minded about um, extra, extra dyad relationships. Mm -hmm. Um, in the conversations that I've had about my research and all the reading that I've done, I mean, there's not much looking at mm. um, people in midlife and older in outside, outside kind of traditional conservative relationships. But what there is seems to be a real open-mindedness to doing something different. So in, 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 the, in my data for my PhD, I talked to people who'd been brought up conservative Christian, very gendered, restricted girlhoods, particularly young women, and then when they'd escaped from the, the long-term marriage, suddenly thought, okay, I want to do things on my own terms now. I'm gonna go get counseling, I'm gonna get my confidence back, I'm gonna learn how to communicate, I'm gonna have relationships on my own terms. Mm. And discovering um, the concept of um, living by yourself, having intimacy and, and connection in your life, but not having to deal with the other, some of the other dimensions of it. Mm -hmm. And having, also having multiple partners as well. Mm. So I... That's, that's my stuff with the baby boomers. Sue Malter, another researcher who's looked at older adults and her, her people, her uh, participants are up to 92, I think. Some of, uh, they were very happily, a lot of them living apart together. So not living, having a relationship, but not wanting, not wanting to cohabit. And some of them are also into not, not wanting to be monogamous. Mm. So I, I think, don't forget that the baby boomer generation went through the sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s, mm. and some people were fully into that lifestyle, mm -hmm. and others kind of saw it happening at a distance and mm. didn't take part. So it's not completely foreign to that so generation. That, but they've planted the idea that, okay, maybe that wasn't right for me in my circumstances as a, in, in their 20s, but in their 50s and 60s they're going, right, well, you know, there's no time to lose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get into yeah. it. And, and certainly the... the um, the online online dating is is very popular with older people. Yes, and that's that's opening up all kinds of interesting yeah. situations. Mm. And this study that you're referring to, the one that was released a couple of weeks ago, one of the statistics with relationship to, or sort of perceived uh, values, I guess, around monogamy and non-monogamy was that 96% of respondents said that they valued monogamy as part of their, their primary relationships or their sole actually, relationships. It was. it was a 97, thank you. Um, yet, they were more accepting of alternative sex practices, and I think what they meant by that was... I don't know, maybe stuff outside of penis in vagina, I'm guessing, is what that means. <laughs> Anywho, uh, my point is, <laughs> why is it, do you think, panel, that there would be such a discrepancy with 97% going, we are monogamous and that's the way it's going to be, yet if you know, we're up for a little bit of anal whatever, whatever... I, okay. I interpreted the diverse stuff as perhaps even same-sex relationships, mm. so not necessarily kinky or um, mm -hmm. non-vanilla kind mm. of sexual, sexual practices. Mm -hmm. I think, I think the, the marriage equality movement has done a lot to promote positive mm. attitudes to same-sex relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but the whole media discourse is, and, and popular culture discourse is that monogamy is the answer and the solution. So mm. the films mm. on friends with benefits relationships have always had the outcome that, you know, really they wanted to be a couple after all, or no, it was never going to work. Mm. And in fact, that's not what the research on friends with benefits shows. Mm -hmm. so, but it, but it, is, it is the popular discourse that monogamy is the, is the expected binary, mm. you know. In the same way that heterosexuality was up until yeah. not that long ago, yeah. yet the shift is really shifting. So what will it take for, for non-monogamy to become a thing? I think part of it is that young people tend to be accepting of what they see around them. And I think simply mainstream media depictions, uh, positive mainstream media depictions, I mean, in the same way that... Uh, that you know, people under 20 these days are, are, are almost universally accepting of same-sex relationships mm. and same-sex marriage. I mean, it's it's pretty much it's almost unanimous when you when they do surveys of you know same-sex marriage support. Um, and the, I think this is because there's been so much more 
positive portrayal in the media. I mean, you just go back 20 years mm-hmm. and there was nowhere near that kind mm-hmm. of representation and public support. So I, I honestly don't know if that same kind of transformation can happen with acceptance of um, the various forms of non-monogamy. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, when Dan Savage came out to Australia last November, mm-hmm. he was... Oh, OK. Um, <laughs> He was promoting consensual non-monogamy. Mm. That was mm. that was a big feature of what he was talking about. He was on Q and A. He was on Radio National. He mm. spoke at the Wheeler Centre. I mean, he 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 was he, Joy FM. So so Joy FM's a more kind of um, niche market, perhaps. But he was talking to mainstream conservative Australia about mm. non-monogamy, and I think that's probably that's a really good way to to mm. to get attitudes changing and mm-hmm. ideas yeah. being shared. And I have to say, I am getting a lot more serious, genuine media um, requests now Mm -hmm. than, like 10 years ago when we first started running our first workshops, um, nobody had heard the word polyamory, Mm -hmm. you know? 10% of your participants may have heard the word. Most people didn't know what it is. Now, most people have heard it Mm -hmm. and have some vague idea of what it is they may have missed or whatever, but um, I I think it feels to me like the interest is building. Mm. And one of the things, so it, I often say that I feel like non-monogamy is where homosexuality was 20 or 30 years ago, mm. except that I think we're going to be a faster move because a much larger percentage of the population isn't monogamous. And if we can encourage people to get over the shame of that mm. and actually start talking about it mm. and look at why and what's not working mm. and how to change that such that it works for people, I think that will help. Mm. And visibility is also incredibly important. Just mm. just that simple sitting up on a stage and talking yeah. about Thanks, it. Thanks, You mm. know, um, the going center. going to going to Pride <laughs> March and walking down the street and yes. waving at people, and yeah. you know, going on the radio, going whatever. You know, mm. having websites, having public meetings and support groups, all these sorts of things. Just being out there so that yeah. people can sort of go, you know, is this is this acceptable, is this normal, am I weird mm, yeah. for wanting this? And just being able to just, just go, oh, no, there are other people who do it. Maybe yeah. I'm not as weird as I thought. Yeah. I was, in, I was an invited speaker at Psychology in the pub in Bendigo a few months ago talking about um, friends with benefits and non-monogamous relationships. And a man came up to me afterwards and said, I saw this on a website and I drove from Melbourne to hear you and I'd never heard of this before and I wanted to know more about it. Wow. wow. So people, it's it kind of, so having the language, having the idea plan, I told him to go to your... your <laughs> <laughs> Thank so you. The relationship's tool belt, yeah. Well, the other thing is that the, um, the internet has made a huge difference. Yes, well, this is the thing. I guess we, we can't really be talking... I'm oh, sorry, tangled up with my jewels here. Um, we can't be talking about the future of sex without talking about technology. Yeah. So what impact has the internet had on all of this, do you think? Massive. It's made it possible, yeah. basically. Yeah. I mean, in what way? Speeded up the process incredibly fast because people can connect. People can Google, and even people who don't know certain words, they, you can Google not monogamy or something like that and come up with all sorts of interesting stuff mm. um, and go from there. Mm. Um, so people can connect with exactly the specific kind of thing that they're interested in. Like if you're interested in solo polyamory, you know, you can actually find it just on the internet. Yeah. Yeah. The. Uh, the website that uh, the Bisexual Alliance had for a few years was one that I threw together in WordPress while sitting at our booth at Sexpo. <laughs> 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 I was just on my laptop, just going tap to tap to tap, and and I did, and it was a few hours' work. And like you know, the 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 process of deciding on a domain and buying the domain and buying hosting and actually setting up the website was a few hours of work. Wow! And that website can reach more people than, you know, like flyers stapled to a telephone pole, you know, mm. the old traditional ways of doing stuff like that. And you're, you know, and it's, and it's that whole website probably cost me less than, uh, you know, a small ad in a newspaper. Mm. It's, and social media, you know, Twitter and Facebook, all these things just, they connect people. Mm-hmm. They connect people and make people, uh, allow people to find others who are like themselves, which does have some negative repercussions, but has a lot of positive ones. Yeah. yeah. I found a whole lot of um, American poly information, mm-hmm. which I li- like Poly Weekly, the podcast mm-hmm. and other things. And then, and then I thought, I wonder what's in Australia. I don't, there's a poly support group in Bendigo, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. where I live. Yeah. And, th- and that blew me away. Are and you they, in it? Yeah. Yeah, good. <laughs> of course. <laughs> 
I'm on the committee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you think just like well, that. I'm on the committee. It doesn't. Yeah, I don't, I don't contribute very much. But um, and so before we open it up to all of you for a Q and A, I'm just going to give one last question to you about because this is being recorded and hopefully, you know, important people, or you are all important people, but other important people will be hearing this. What policy recommendations would you like to make to folk who may have a bit more power than some of us here about the way these relationships are viewed in, in a broader cultural sense? First one, put a question about non-monogamy on the, on the census mm. ah. so that we've got some idea of how many people there are. Mm. Um, so, yes, uh, demo big demographic studies, it's really hard to get the right question mm. that, that elicits what's going on. So, mm. yeah, that's a great idea. Mm. And, and, on, and we're thinking of bisexuality and even gender, just those standard forms, not to have, at least even if there's an other oh, box. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So, yes. if, if it's, so that at so least the there's sex, an indication gender, of something relationship, else. Relationship, yeah. sexuality. Yeah. Mm. Because that binary thing is, yeah. which box do you tick? You know? and, and, so, and so often there's clearly no real consultation when, when doing things like this. Like a, a friend of mine who's, who's transgender filled out a government form that had sexual orientation listed in the same list as transgender and you could only tick one box. And oh, it's like, goodness. Th these are the sorts of things that people sometimes don't even really think yeah. about because they haven't, they haven't done any kind of consultation yeah. or research. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think it's necessarily insensitive or, or you know... It's just a lack of it's awareness. Just, it's just a lack of awareness and a lack of knowledge. And that's yeah. where we need really good education. Mm. So really good ed uh, where uh, sex and sexuality and gender and mm. relationships is part of um, certainly uh, social worker, health worker, teacher, edu mm. pre-service education mm -hmm. and professional development. Mm. You know what I really want to see? What do you want to see? I want to see communication skills taught in primary school. Oh, mm. shit, yeah. Yes. Um, I want to pe people to learn how to relate. I mean, all of the skills that we've been talking about that you need in polyamory, you need in monogamy as well for good, deep, intimate mm, Well, you just need them in life. You, you just need, need them life. to function at the supermarket. And I want to see those... <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. Just, well, as Kate Bornstein says, yes. don't be mean. So yeah. many people haven't even learnt that one yet. Yeah. <laughs> and I really want to see that taught at a very young age so that by the time they're actually starting to, like, relate romantically and intimately and mm. sexually and whatever to other people, they've got some skills with mm. which to do it and mm. with which to communicate about it yeah. and to have some vague idea of what they want and, and, and what, you know, what might mm. be possible. What can I say? Awesome panel, but you know you're awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, Thanks, Sally. I had a question going back to this one about children and, you know, the sort of, we'll say, structures and adults in a child's life. In the past, we've had tribes where aunts, uncles, grandparents have been involved in children's lives. We've had the concept of godparents, you know, parents who are responsible if something happens to incapacitate, we'll say, the parents of origin in early, early in a child's life. What do you think shifted the concept back to a two-parent situation and might be obvious, but what do we need to do to change it so that we can get the concept of having adults into young people's lives, including adults in poly, we'll say tribes, that can show the benefits of that for young people? Do you want to take that or...? I don't have an immediate answer to that, no. I don't know. Um, I think there's a lot of historical... Um, reasons why we dropped from being the extended family to the nuclear family. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a researcher, I'm not an expert in that stuff, so I don't honestly know that I can speak to that exactly. Um, but I do think it has been... I think that people will look back um, in some centuries and millennia to come on the nuclear family as a failed experiment. Um, mm. Mm. Because you, there has been... It, it, it has involved more and more work for fewer and fewer adults. Mm. And there have been fewer and fewer resources to go around and the whole community has been affected as a result. Mm. What we do about it, um, there are so many different things. I was actually thinking of our friend Sarah, um, who's written a kid's book, and she's planning to write a series of kid's books featuring 
uh, families with multiple adults in unspecified relationships. Oh, the Crusader's waving it at me from down the back. Oh. Right from the robots. <laughs> it's for sale. Does that mean that's for sale, Crusader? Yes, it's for so, sale. Fancy but, that. But this is one of the things. Getting these images into young people's mm -hmm. lives so that they, so that um, something other than the traditional thing is represented mm. from an early age so that it's normalised and it's okay and it gives people permission to work out where they want to go with it. I mean, I could rabbit on for a very long time about other things that I think, you know, obviously in terms of legislation and, and a bunch of things that we... Uh, we need to do. But that's one of the things that I think is getting more representations to young people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And even building codes and how and the design of houses, the expectation that houses will be set up for nuclear families and, and just, just all, all having uh, maybe facilitating intentional communities where, where people can live together in, mm -hmm. in bigger spaces. Maybe because I mean we can talk about ways of doing you know it. like yeah. social evolution and it's all very speculative um, you know, evolutionary psychology but there is very strong evidence that the reason we live as long as we do is specifically because of communal living I mean we have people who are you know long past the age where they can actually you know safely reproduce but and biologically there needs to be some reason why we live that long and one of the very one of the strong arguments for that is that we're meant to have multiple generations all living and working together and cooperating. Mm. 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 Well, we used not to live as long as we do now. Well, yes. Thanks. Um, hi, my name's Tash. Uh, it's just a quick question um, about permission. You were talking a lot about, um, well, you've said a lot about permission and people seeking permission. Who are they, at, this is more asking for you know, your thoughts on who are people most likely seeking permission from other than themselves? Uh, permission to explore what they want. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think um, primarily oneself and one's enculturated parents and one's enculturated teachers and one's enculturated church people and stuff like that. Um, and then obviously one's partners that one has, happens to be connected to. Um, but I think... I think always the hardest permission for anybody considering stepping outside is always oneself mm -hmm. to start with. And it's something we see, again, coming back to this idea of, um, of pleasure being seen as wasteful. Um, it's something you see so often in advertising uh, in the media. Um, things like, you know, chocolate is advertised as, you know, this is, this is a treat that you've earned. And mm. so there's this idea of like, you know, so you want to seek this pleasurable thing, but you have to earn it and you have to prove that you're worthy of it. Mm. Um, mm. You know, like we get you you know, products with slogans like, you know, you've earned it or you deserve it or mm. because mm. you're worth it. Mm. You know, <laughs> these, are, these are things. And it's like there's this idea of like, you know, you've worked hard enough to, to earn this very special treat. Mm. Now, now get back on the treadmill. Because just <laughs> wanting it isn't good enough. Yeah. And just picking up on, on that concept about permission, I heard a story recently about uh, a child at a school where they've got one of these um, school chaplains or the, where, where the religious programs are allowed to go in and run activities at lunchtime and stuff. And this, this young person always used to embrace his friends and now, no, you can't touch because that's, mm -hmm. that's not allowed. So it's almost mm -hmm. like permission in, in some teaching, even permission to be affectionate is being denied because any touch is seen as sexual and sex is wrong. So mm -hmm. I think that's, that's, a, that's a significant thing to be aware of and to work against. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's pr proliferation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Really? But, but yet consent is sexy, thinking about permission. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. There's a question, the There's a question at the back. I suppose my question is to anybody in the panel, and um, we heard a little bit about marriage equality earlier within the, the gay community, and I, I think the queer community um, has maybe been very open to the concepts of diverse relationships and non-monogamy and um, sort of co-parenting and different types of relationships, and the question maybe is the, the marriage equality agenda, how do you think that could affect um, this sort of diversity in relationships within the queer community? Mm. And maybe like the sort of could it impact it or could it strengthen it or could it be more like sort of heteronormative concept? I, I have a sort of, oh, sorry. I, I have a uh, very mixed feelings about that whole thing because 
on, on the one hand, uh, the marriage equality movement has fought so hard for the recognition that they have and the mainstream acceptance that they have. And I can understand uh, people at the centre of that movement being quite defensive and being quite protective of their movement and being protective of the gains that they've made. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, if, if you require people to be hidden away in the back room in order to make your movement work, maybe there's a problem, you know, because... Uh, Who's, been, who's sitting in the back room? I don't understand. We, uh, uh, we people in non-monogamous non relationships oh, right. so, have been have so been it's okay told to say we can have same-sex marriage, but we can't do polyamorous relationships. It's, it's not that's, even that's sex with ducks, and there'll be goats next. It's that's not even so much that. I mean, um, we have been publicly told, please stop, stop making noise about you know the kind of relationships you have, because we want the straight monogamous community to accept that we're just like them, only gay. Mm. And mm. and look, and look, this has been a this has been a a useful paradigm to work from. It's like to say, you look, hey, we're just regular people like you. We just love someone different. You know, I can see how this is a useful social tool, if you know what I mean, like to 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 increase acceptance and awareness of of, uh, of marriage equality. But at the same time, it's it's a very narrow model, mm -hmm. and and when and now that we've sort of gotten into that groove, it's difficult to get out of it. You know. That's the thing that I think concerns me, is that, um, you know, uh, the, let's call it the gay movement that started in the 60s and 70s and 80s and, and so on. Back then, there was a, um, it, it was everybody who wasn't, you know, the, the heteronormative, heteronormative um, uh, uh, was part of the same movement. And there, I absolutely, utterly, utterly, utterly endorse um, anybody's right to have whatever kind of relationship they want and I'm right behind, and we all are, the um, equal marriage push to get that recognised. Mm. But I am really concerned about the distancing that's been happening um, mm. from some of the, um, not just non-monogamous, but some of the, some of the um, other groups. Mm. Um, and I am concerned about the possibility that once recognition, which is obviously happening and is going to happen, uh, once that occurs, that we are then going to have to turn around and debate the people that we've been supporting mm. all this time mm. to have our relationships mm. recognised. Mm. So again, it sort of almost fits into that binary of you're either with us or you're against mm. us rather than yeah. there are multiple versions of this and I that really, can exist. I mean, I really do understand the need to have... For a political achievement, you've got to have a single lobby with a single mm. word, uh, you know, single message. Yeah. It's really mm. got to be simple. That's all fine. But I really am... There are things about it mm. that concern mm. me. Mm. I mean, there has been at least one prominent person in marriage equality who has basically said, shh, stop wow. it. Wow. You know, don't stop, stop being so public about the kind of relationships you have because you're damaging us. And, oh. yeah... That's not very inclusive, is it? No. And it was a, it was a bit hurtful. Yeah. <laughs> There's a question down here. Oh. Thank you. Next? Thank you uh, for uh, sharing. Um, with respect, I'd like to know what your thoughts are on the future of sex toys. Sex stores? Toys. 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 Excuse me. So I'm thinking technological. Um, yeah, I... Um, okay. Yeah. It's a booming industry. <laughs> I, I think there's fantastic potential for, for sexual health promotion to be done at sex toy parties. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. It's certainly something that's becoming more recognised and more accepted. Um, and one of the things that I think is cool is the, this idea that a sex toy isn't just something you use on your own for your own pleasure. It's something that you can use with someone else or even multiple someone's else. <laughs> um, and it can be, and it's. Big, I, I think there has been this idea that, like, you know, a toy is something you turn to when you don't have anyone else. But mm. I, I love this idea that's becoming more and more common that it's something you can use to, in, you can enjoy with someone. I think that's a great positive movement. I'm not sure that I know. Don't know that I have an answer <laughs> to that question. Yeah. I, yeah. I think they seem to be becoming more and more. Uh, Elaborate and high tech is my observation, which mm -hmm. I 
I, I mean, I guess it's fine. I'm, re I'm really into old school vibrators personally, but that's just my little <laughs> thing. Uh, and I just announced that in front of a room full of people. <laughs> Anywho. On video. Yeah, <laughs> on video as well. Um, yeah, I, I think it, it's just, it's never ending, the whole sex toy thing, and whether it's for one or five, who knows? That could be a niche market, actually, making, like, star-shaped love toys. Yeah. That could. For poly groups. Wow, maybe I'm in the wrong industry. Maybe I've got this <laughs> sixth sense for, for new toys. But so make sure they're body safe material. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you, you were saying earlier that um, your lifestyle brings you a lot of pleasure, but then you were also saying that it's a myth that um, people ha who have that lifestyle don't feel jealousy. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that um, the pleasure is worth, worth the pain of, of sort of that you feel when you, when you feel jealous, or are you saying that um, the, the longer you, you're in that sort of lifestyle because jealousy is socialised, you feel it less over time? No, it's not because it's socialised, it's because I've done a lot of work on... I mean, I'm actually somebody who hasn't f experienced jealousy that often, but that doesn't matter. I may still come up against it. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, the I've done a lot of personal work on understanding where that sort of stuff comes from, breaking it down, looking at each individual element and um, responding to that um, with personal growth and, and therapy and, and whatever. And that journey means that I am so much more secure in myself. This is irrespective of any other connections that I have. And that then means that I am able to genuinely hear what is on offer from someone else and genuinely decide if there's something in that that I want to take up and genuinely um, uh, allow a relationship to be what it is without trying to push it into anything that it doesn't want to be. Um, and that means that I am much freer to simply enjoy what is on offer. I think it's important to recognise as well that there's no one universal experience of this mm. sort of thing. There are people for whom it is a fight. You know, it's a real struggle. It's something they work on and work on and work on and they dedicate themselves to it and it's and it, co it costs them a lot and, you know, they may feel that it's worth it, but it does cost them. And there are others for whom it's so natural and so mm. easy Mm. And uh, that it, it's really it's something they just take to, mm. you know, like a duck to water, and they. And it, relationships they never are hard work. I mm. see as a working as a sex and relationship therapist. I see monogamous people really struggling mm. with that. Mm. That I think there's no version of relationship that is superior or inferior. Mm. If you are going to connect with another human being, you are going to have feelings. Mm. Actually, that is a really good point, and I really want to make that. There's um, absolutely behind monogamy that works, and monogamy mm. can work really well. And I'm absolutely, I would never say that non monogamy was better yeah. than Th monogamy. There are, there are monogamous people in the world, and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> We've all yeah. got to learn to share the planet. That's right. <laughs> and and on that note, <laughs> um, speaking of sharing, thank you for sharing your Wednesday evening with us, audience members. Please give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs>